Today we will look at section 8.1 in the chapter on friction um, and this is uh, going to be the only content we will focus in on for chapter 8. Um, so I'll begin with an introduction to friction and then go on to describe the laws of dry friction and then end with some example problems. Okay, so, so let's think about friction. You know, um, it's all around us. It helps us walk. It helps us, uh, you know, cycle. It helps us roll, roll our blade and things like that, right? Uh, thus far in our problem solving um, environment uh, of this class, we have either assumed that contacts between surfaces are frictionless, uh, that means they can move freely with each other, with respect to each other, or they are very rough, right? And that means that the the contact between the two prevents uh, any uh, motion due to the tangential forces that are present between the surfaces. So in reality, um, you know, friction always exists when two surfaces are in contact. Okay, you can make it very small, but you cannot completely eliminate it. Okay, and uh, these these uh, uh, forces that arise, uh, which are tangential, that means if I have surface one. And I have surface two here below, um, and, uh, and I look at the forces that you know lie along the interface, which are tangential to the normal of the uh, surface, uh, or uh, uh, which are along the uh, plane of the surface. Um, then these are called tangential forces, and these uh, can be friction forces, right? And so whenever there's a contact, you will have friction forces. In fact, um, friction forces can be extremely useful or be a nuisance. Uh, here's a nice way to, you know, kind of think about friction in the context of um, things around us uh, and how actually friction is used or controlled uh, in, in many mechanical systems. So if you think of an automobile, you know, you have a wheel uh, which is round because uh, that actually reduces the amount of friction that is required the the the, the rotary motion re reduces the amount of friction required as compared to sliding the car on the road or dragging the car on the road right now the wheel itself is uh, is made up of uh, treads the rubber is made up of treads so that it increases friction and grip on the road so you can see the counterbalancing on one hand we want rotational motion on the other hand we want tread so that in the car doesn't slip uh, so likewise, if you have a, you look at the braking system, you apply when you apply brakes, it's it's basically using friction to stop the car, right? And uh, when you have uh, the engine start up in a gasoline engine, the pistons are um, are moving back and forth, and you want to minimize the friction uh, between the piston uh, and the chamber wall so that you have a maximum efficiency uh, for power delivered by the friction. And you have a belt that is being driven by the motion of the piston, and that's a uh, high friction belt called the drive belt, and that's what ultimately uh, turns uh, turns the uh, uh, turns the wheels. Right? And so there are many examples here where either you use high friction or you use low friction, need low friction for the application to work. Well. Okay, so it's a very important topic, yeah. and in general, it's both very useful and could be problematic depending on the situation. Now uh, there are in general two types of friction. Uh, one is called dry friction or coulomb friction and the other is fluid friction. And fluid friction is you know uh, it applies to the case when you have uh, uh, lubricated uh, uh, surfaces that means you put oil uh, between two surfaces to make them you know uh, flow past each other or move past each other in as low friction uh, 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 process as possible, right? So that's where fluid friction comes in. We are not going to talk about that in this class and we'll only discuss dry friction uh, between surfaces that have no oil or other lubricant between them. Yeah. Now one thing at the outset it's important to remember that friction is limited in magnitude 
and depending on the amount of force you apply you may or may not be able to prevent motion due to this friction okay so we are going to look at that uh, in more detail so let's begin by looking at uh, now the laws of dry friction right so at the outset you know the simplest way to uh, start here is to think about um, a block resting on on um, on a horizontal surface right so the block of weight w and um, and and then let's look at the forces that are acting out here so one is the weight w acting downwards right and then we know that um, because of the contact normal to the contact between the block and the floor is an is an, is a force called the reaction force n that's acting upwards okay so in this particular instant it's clear that the block is not going to move in the horizontal direction right it's not going to move in this in this direction here uh, that's along uh, uh, along uh, the interface okay so now <coughs> let's think about what will happen if we do apply a force uh, called p on the horizontal direction okay so that's this case here now okay now um, when we apply a force p uh, as we ap start applying it we will find that you know it will take some effort before the block actually starts moving okay and that means that even though we have uh, a force p here the net movement is zero which means that there must be an opposing force acting on it and this opposing force is called the force of friction okay uh, in this case it's called static friction because the body has not started moving yet so remember equilibrium requires that sigma fx equals zero and so that means your applied force p is going to be um, p plus f is going to be zero and so your friction force is going to be uh, in opposite in direction to your applied force p right? so this is uh, this is uh, friction force now as I keep increasing my the value of my load P right at some point from experience you know that this block is going to move okay and and uh, so this uh, at this point at which you have reached uh, the maximum force before which your block starts moving um, has a value which we call FM it's the maximum friction force that you can apply during uh, the time that the block is stationary and it is defined as FM this maximum friction force called the static friction because your block is not moving as yet is a quantity called mu s multiplied by the normal force m okay so mu s is called uh, uh, the uh, the value of the static it, it measures the magnitude of the static friction it's called the coefficient of static friction okay now as you increase the force beyond FM you'll suddenly see that it seems easier to move the object because now it has gone past a situation where it is in equilibrium static equilibrium and now it starts moving okay so this is where it starts moving and it turns out that now the force you need to apply to continue to make it move is actually smaller than this maximum force that you applied okay so this force now F let's call it um, uh, kinetic fk is going to be given by something like mu k dot n and mu k is the coefficient of kinetic friction right so these are the two uh, uh, two friction forces so one is the static friction this is the coefficient of static friction uh, of static friction and and mu k is the coefficient of kinetic friction so these are the two laws of dry friction in a sense um, you have static friction and you have kinetic friction so what you can see from here is that the maximum value of the kinetic friction or, or of the static friction mu k or rather uh, the mu s is actually going to be less than the maximum value of the kinetic friction coefficient mu k okay so this is something that um, we know from experience because it's easier to, once the body is moving it's easier to keep it moving then uh, just to get it moving right when it was in a stationary position okay so um, so this uh, this position here 
just before it starts moving where you applied the maximum static friction force is known as impending motion that means motion is just about to begin okay um, so now let's look at what is the magnitude of the friction force based on understanding how much uh, or how large the mu k and the mu s can be so at the outset one thing to remember is that the amount of friction uh, or the coefficients of friction they do not depend on the contact area rather it depends on the nature of the surfaces right so here's a table of uh, you know approximate values of static friction for dry surfaces so the way you can do this measurement is that you take a block put it on an appropriate surface um, so let's say you put a metal block on a metal surface or a wood block on a wood surface or a rubber block on a concrete surface and you apply the load and you apply and you push it and you see uh, where you get motion and from that you can calculate based on the normal normal uh, reaction force and you can calculate what the coefficient of uh, static friction was and you'll find that it ranges between you know 0.15 all the way to the value of 1 which is which is very large right so so uh, static friction um, uh, it depends on you know how smooth or how rough the surface is again from experience we know that if you want to reduce friction we try to keep the two surfaces as smooth as possible okay? that's when you get um, uh, low friction when you push against each other on the other hand you know when two surfaces are very clean uh, and it's 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 removed of all impurities then you can actually have very good contact between the two and in fact you can make them stick so you may have this experience by taking two glass slides and they stick really well because and that's not actually a friction effect that has to do with the fact that there is um, uh, air trap between them and the surface tension actually helps to uh, increase the sticking force so sometimes distinguishing between the cause of surface tension a uh, cause of friction to the actual phenomena that's uh, uh, causing objects to uh, stick to each other uh, need, needs to be thought through carefully okay. okay now one of the things is that kinetic friction as I said is smaller than static friction it turns out typically the maximum value of the coefficient of kinetic friction mu k is about 75 percent of that of mu s the maximum value of the static friction okay okay so um, so just to recap some of the things that uh, one should keep in mind as we start working on friction problems is this that uh, when you think about static or kinetic friction um, those forces that arise are proportional to the value of the normal flow so this is probably the most important takeaway so going back to our, um, our starting point here so we have a reaction force n and we have w right so this this uh, friction force f so let's say i'm applying force p here the friction force f is going to be proportional to the n so you can see that the larger uh, and now n in turn is going to be uh, related to the w and maybe any other component of p uh, that acts in the vertical direction as we will look okay so it's important to keep in mind that it's proportional to the normal force so you need to be able to calculate the total normal force in order to be able to calculate the total frictional force and of course it depends on type and condition of the contact surfaces and very important it's independent of the contact area so let's look at uh, you know applying the laws of friction to a horizontal surface now again we we're looking at the rigid body that's in contact with the horizontal surface as shown here and uh, based on this we can come up with four different scenarios case one which is shown here is that there is no horizontal uh, component of force right so there's nothing that's applied in this direction and so um, and so that means there is no opposing friction force here so in a way the friction force f is zero uh, because uh, there is no x component so sigma fx is zero that means p equals f equals zero here right that's our equilibrium equation for the x direction but now let's look at case two okay so now we apply a small um, force p 
which has a component along the x direction which you call px as is y direction which you call py right so now in order for equilibrium we have sigma px uh, or rather uh, for equilibrium along the x let me write sigma fx equals 0 that means px minus f uh, equals 0 uh, by the way in my earlier uh, slide I had written uh, the sum of the forces is px pl p plus f and that should actually be p minus f right because f is pointing in the opposite direction so this tells us that px equals f so the friction force is going to be equal to the, the x component of p right? now um, now uh, what happens here is that because there is no motion that means the value of our friction force F or Px is actually less than uh, the the maximum friction force that can be uh, allowed here in the static case which is the normal force times mu s okay now what is the normal force here so remember it's in equilibrium in the y direction so in order to find the normal force I'm going to write down Sigma Fy equals 0 and so you can see here that we have uh, PY that's acting down uh, I call it negative I have negative W and I have normal force acting up and so that gives me normal force is W plus PY so our maximum friction force is going to be FS maximum static friction force is going to be FS equals mu S times W plus PY okay and so that's uh, that's what is shown out here right so clearly uh, uh, in this case px is less than this uh, this uh, maximum force so we haven't reached uh, the point of impending motion at this in, in this case yet okay let's look at what happens at impending motion well at impending motion essentially your fx uh, rather your your uh, x component of the p uh, is the maximum static friction force that you can apply fm and that means you have mu s times n and as we just calculated this is nothing but mu s times w plus the x uh, the y component of your p right? so that's what this here and that's what you have here yeah. and finally when you have motion then as you remember from the plot earlier uh, as a function of uh, um, uh, let's see what was it we plotted uh, f uh, um, we go back a second here so if you look at this plot uh, we had f as a function of the applied load p so in this case we can say that p or px um, <clears throat> so as a function of p so we, there was no motion and then at motion it stopped and then you know it dropped and then it became f kinetic right and so uh, your px value exceeds the value of f kinetic um, which is now given by mu k times n right? and so the actual value of n still remains uh, related to w plus py okay so just remember that part okay so the next thing we can look at is something called the angle of friction um, and this one applies to the case when you have block of weight w that's resting on on a slope of angle theta right so in this case theta equals zero in the first case but what happens if you uh, tilt it and you have now a different angle here um, let's call it theta uh, in this case is less than phi d so now um, you have um, again based on the applied force P uh, one can think of a reaction force uh, that acts on this block so this reaction force here in this case is the same as the normal force uh, but as you start tilting uh, the reaction force you can think of it as in the vertical direction uh, while remember the normal force always acts perpendicular to the interfaces right so the reaction force becomes a little bit different from the normal force in fact um, uh, depending on whether you want to represent it in an xy coordinate system like this or an XY coordinate system like that uh, you will have to change using the angles provided right now so the case one here is that um, you know the angle Phi is 0 uh, which is this particular case here and if you have no px there's going to be no friction force so f is 0 
Now it turns out that you can define an angle of static friction called phi s. And phi s is basically this angle. Um, what we're looking at is, okay, how much do I have to tilt this, um, this surface up uh, so that the block just starts sliding so or this reach impending motion right so we are not applying directly a force to it we are just letting the component of the weight acting along the horizontal direction or along the direction um, of the plane of uh, uh, the surface it's sitting on provide that additional px value effectively and so that is called um, the angle at which uh, that's called the angle of static friction right so uh, so the way you define it is that um, at impending motion you know fm has reached uh, mu s n and um, and your phi uh, just reaches phi s right and this tan phi s is going to be given by the ratio of fm divided by n so uh, so uh, work through the figure there and convince yourself that the uh, um, so that tan phi s is fm by n which incidentally turns out to be uh, the coefficient of static friction okay so that's the that's the reason this is uh, an important discussion because the angle of friction at impending motion the tan of that uh, that slope the angle is uh, is the coefficient of static friction so it's an easy way to measure the coefficient of static friction for many objects right so you just you know raise the uh, angle of this slope here and at the point the block starts sliding uh, you measure the angle and right away you have the coefficient of static friction between the object and the surface it's on okay now um, so that's just before it starts sliding right um, so what you can do now is that you um, uh, once it starts sli sliding, you can actually reduce back the slope of this angle uh, in order to continue to make it slide, right? So you can make it slide at a smaller angle than you would have um, uh, in order to begin the, the motion. So this angle at which you can lower it down to and still have sliding motion is called the angle of kinetic friction phi k and again that reduces to uh, the fact that tan phi k is going to be uh, the coefficient of kinetic friction mu k which is um, the the f k over n okay the kinetic friction over n force of kinetic friction over n okay all right so with that let's um, go on to solving uh, two example problems and uh, so the first one is here so you can pause the video if you want and read through the problem um, so we have uh, a block on an inclined plane the inclined plane is uh, you know basically given the angle is given here uh, by uh, by noting these numbers so you can use that to convert this into a theta value um, coefficients of friction between the block and the plane are given so you can see mu s is 0.25 mu k is a little bit smaller 0.2 and the question asks for whether the block is in equilibrium and then uh, also to find the value of the friction force under this condition here okay so uh, this type of problem is called a friction problem of the first type uh, because uh, you're given the forces and the friction coefficients and you want to find out if the crate moves so remember the step one in such a problem is going to be what you've been practicing so far which is to create the free body diagram of the block and put all the forces and find out the condition for equilibrium right so draw the fbd of the crate in order to maintain equilibrium so here is what we've done so we have removed the contact so left behind the various forces so we have the normal force here we have the friction acting between the two surfaces and we have the weight acting downwards uh, and we know the angle uh, that's provided to us right so that's the same as this angle here okay so now uh, we have chosen the x-axis and y-axis to be conveniently located in these directions here to ease uh, the calculation also the fact that we are actually trying to figure out what's happening along along the interface or along the plane of the um, the ground that this crate has been sitting on uh, which is at an incline of theta right? so now we can write down 
are equilibrium equations so sigma fx so let's look at the components here so 100 is the force that we are uh, pushing um, along the positive x width so it is a positive value and we have the friction force which is opposing it so that's a negative value here and finally we have the x component of the weight uh, that's uh, that's going to be acting downward so that's a negative value and it's given by 3 over 5 300 so from this we find that f is equal to minus 80 pounds right? that tells you that uh, basically the direction of f that we started out with is negative that means it's actually pointing this way and so it immediately gives you a clue as to what is happening in this problem what is happening in this problem is that remember the most important one of the most important rules of friction is that the friction force is always opposing motion okay so if this is turning out to be negative that means our block is actually sliding down under these conditions given here right and we will come to that in a moment so go ahead and do Fy, uh, sigma Fy field zero, and you find that the normal component of uh, uh, the normal the normal force is 240 pounds, um, as you would expect because uh, we have uh, only a partial amount of this uh, of this weight acting um, in the normal direction, right? Okay, so um, so finally you know we want to calculate basically the maximum friction force and compare it to the existing friction force right so the maximum friction force is nothing but uh, mu s times n so we calculate the normal force n and the static friction is 0.25 so our maximum friction force is 60 pounds okay but um, uh, this 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 maximum friction force is actually smaller than the force that we found that's uh, actually being acted on uh, 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 through friction which was negative 80 pounds and that also tells us that now the block is actually sliding down the plane so our maximum friction force is not sufficient to keep the block uh, in equilibrium okay. and finally we can also look at what the kinetic friction force is and that is mu k times n and you see that that is 48 pounds and that's what's uh, shown out here okay. so once the block is sliding then the friction force that's acting on it is 50 is 48 pounds so that's really what is happening here um, block is sliding down a friction force kinetic friction force of 48 pounds is acting along the positive x direction along with your applied force of 100 pounds so a total of 148 pounds is acting along the uh, positive x direction in this case yeah. okay let's uh, do one more problem here and this involves uh, again you can stop the video and there should be this is a distance x let's measure from here um, uh, <coughs> so the question here is that so you can see that we have a bracket that can move up and down this uh, pipe and we are given the coefficient of friction between the pipe and the bracket and you want to determine the minimum distance x at which the load uh, so here is the load that we are applying load p at which the load can be uh, supported and an approximation is provided we can neglect the weight of the bracket so first is you know just think through this problem when we apply this load here we can see that we are applying a moment right uh, with respect to the axis of our diameter uh, of our pipe that means in our equilibrium uh, equation we are going to also look at uh, summation of the moments uh, so that we maintain equilibrium besides just summation in the fx and fy forces so let's go ahead and and this by the way this is called a friction problem of third type where you have the coefficient of static friction uh, uh, under impending motion and um, and uh, 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 so, so you have both the coefficient of static friction and you know that motion is uh, about to begin so it's impending motion again just to remind you as I mentioned earlier we have both sliding motion and the possibility of a rotation right? okay so again begin by drawing the F body uh, FBD and finding equilibrium so here is uh, one way to draw the free body diagram so we have taken the bracket and removed it from its support which is the pipe and so we are left with the reaction forces at the top and bottom positions of the bracket um, 
so you can see how this is chosen so if I push down here uh, this side is pushing in while this side is pushing in this way right? so I have reaction forces have taken A and B okay and this also helps us understand where the compensating moment is actually going to come from so we have N as normal force at B and NA is normal force at A and then we have the two Y components along with uh, the applied uh, uh, applied force W yeah. okay so we go through the X and Y equilibrium conditions the X tells us that NB equals NA and the Y tells us that FA plus FB minus W equals zero so we still have some unknowns we want to remove um, um, before we get to that we also know from the problem that impending motion so that means the the forces uh, FA and FB which are friction forces are going to be given by uh, mu s times NA and mu s times NB right so that's 0.25 times NA and NB um, this if you take this and put it back here it tells us that the W is going to be 0.5 times NA or 0.5 times NB depending on which one you want to work with okay so the last one is is the moment equation and you can see here now that oops, sorry about that so let me go back. Uh, <clears throat> the moment um, equation tells us that <clears throat> I can take the moment either about B or A in this case we take it about B so now we have uh, the normal component of A which is 6 inches above and going in the counterclockwise direction and assign it the positive sign then I have FA which is pointing up and it's a distance of 3 inches so it's and it's acting in the clockwise direction so I'll give it a negative sign and finally W which is a distance of 1.5 inches um, uh, actually it's a distance of x minus 1.5 inches because uh, 1.5 is the radius of the tube here while x is the distance from the center of the tube to w and this is acting in the clockwise direction with the ne so it's again negative sign and so that basically leads us to the answer that x equals 12 inches for the condition of e maintaining equilibrium here in rotation as well as uh, sliding motion yeah okay so that wraps up our uh, our content for chapter 8 and we will not be doing any more here uh, through the home assignment you will work on some additional problems that involve uh, dry friction uh, like the ones that we worked through here um, so hopefully you have now uh, exposure to the laws of friction uh, we have static and kinetic friction and you transition from static to kinetic at the point of impending motion uh, remember the friction force always opposes motion so as soon as motion changes direction your friction force has also changed direction right and in motion uh, you're looking at uh, kinetic friction okay. and remember that you know depending on the load you apply a friction force is limited and at some point you're going to exceed it and uh, and motion is going to begin so with that, um, thank you for listening and uh, look out for some example problems that will come through your home assignment.